Thanks, Rick. It's, uh, uh, it's an honor to be here this morning with uh, the other speakers because I, they're more knowledgeable. They, they get the oldest guy to give the general background talk, <laughs> and then they fill in everything that's new. And, uh, so. so that's my disclosure side. I, I disclose that I, I worked for NIH most of my life. And, uh, from no other uh, companies. <clears throat> so each day, um, we all have to answer several questions uh, with regard to eating and things like when to eat, how much to eat, uh, what to eat, uh, maybe with whom to eat, all kinds of questions. And some of the answers are uh, consciously done and many of them are subconscious. And the what I'm going to talk about today is um, a, a, di a dichotomy that you find in the literature between two supposed subdivisions, homeostatic and non-homeostatic. I'll say up front that one of the messages I want to give is that I'm not sure that this is a useful dichotomy anymore. Um, and how they interact in the brain and how they interact with uh, reward systems. So why do we eat? Um, I think most of us have probably already eaten something this morning, and I think anybody, even a, a grade school child, would say, well, we eat to get the energy that we need to uh, keep our body going. And the question is, is this true to the concept of homeostasis, that our body is trying to keep a certain amount of fat uh, on our bones, and if it gets too low, we'll eat more and bring it up to where it ought to be, and if we overeat, we'll eat less and bring it down to where it ought to be. This was the concept of homeostasis that Walter Cannon gave us a long, almost 100 years ago. And an important question is, does our food intake, in fact, match our energy expenditure so that we can, in fact, uh, regulate this way? Or do we eat for non-homeostatic reasons? Uh, several of them are here, hedonics, reward value, opportunity, social reasons, stress. These would all be considered non-homeostatic in current lingo in a lot of uh, uh, literature. And I'm going to talk about how and whether and if these things interact and, and what we should know about them. So. I am a neuroscientist, but I like simple views of the brain, and uh, ones that even I can understand, because whatever. So here's how I conceptualize homeostatic controls. You can take a bunch of signals. I put up three that are, are known to be influential, insulin, leptin, glucose. They uh, interact with parts of the brain, the hypothalamus, the hind brain, things like this, and they influence behavior. And non-homeostatic controls. You can take another slice of the brain, uh, maybe the amygdala, the nucleus accumbens, and so on, and ultimately, they feed into the same mechanisms that determine eating or not eating, or how much to eat. And obviously, there's a lot of, oh, and, and let me point out, food and drugs of abuse both interact with both of these systems, and obviously, uh, there's a lot of uh, overlap, maybe interference between the two. So that's a slide that I've shown before, but, but I've, I've updated it a little. And so here's the two sort of turned on their sides like a funnel, feeding into the common uh, uh, part of the brain uh, that's controlling behavior. And, but it's more complex than this. First of all, at every level, the two are interacting and cross-talking all of the time. It's not like there's one system for homeostasis and another one for non-homeostasis. Those are our words, not the brain's words. Secondly, if we consider simply drugs of abuse, these are very uh, uh, powerful drugs that interact, for the most part, with certain kinds of receptors, uh, dopamine receptors, and there's a lot of dopamine receptors up in this particular system. And dopamine, as I'm sure you'll hear from uh, many of the speakers, is associated with reward. It's got a positive valence. We do things that uh, will turn on the dopamine in parts of our brain, 
even if we're expecting something good, dopamine goes up. And it's not just drugs of abuse, palatable food feed into this, sex feeds into it. Good things turn on dopamine in the brain. Should be simple. Oh, I pushed it one, more, one time too often. But the same things actually feed into the hypothalamus, not directly, but indirectly. And there's a newer player on the block called the orexins. In a way, it's like dopamine. Uh, but rather than reward per se, it's what I call a pay attention molecule. Because whether something's good or bad, if it's something that you need to pay attention to, orexins mediate that. And, and I put those two cartoons up there with, with these points going out because both the dopamine system and the orexin system project to lots of other brain areas. And so one tells you good things are happening, the other says you should be, pay attention to what's happening. Two different kinds of, uh, of controls. So we're studying this, or I've been studying it forever because of, of this reason. I'm interested in food intake and body weight. And if you look at population statistics, we're getting heavier. We've been getting heavier for the last few decades. Body weight of populations, countries, many individuals uh, is going up. It's sometimes called the obesity epidemic. What should we know about it for today? First of all, it's not new. Uh, obesity's been around a long time. Uh, it was revered in, uh, by ancient peoples. They made their uh, little statues of fat goddesses, and uh, I presume that's because they liked people who were fat. Its incidence is increasing. That's what you need to know. It's been called this epidemic. Many people think that because we're getting fat, our regulatory system is uh, not working. Somehow, if we've got a, a good regulatory system, how is it that we're getting fat, right? I mean, it makes no sense. And obviously, uh, food intake is involved. So, I was brought up, that means when I was a graduate student, to believe that uh, our energy balance fits some kind of a model like this. We do more work, we eat more food. We eat more food, we gotta exercise more to get rid of it, that everything's in balance. It's a nice homeostatic model. And the question is, what are the data, the kinds of data that support this? This was an, an early paper, 30 some years ago now, uh, by Eileen Bernstein and myself. We did a very simple thing with, with four groups of rats. There's some controls in the middle. The other three groups, we put a tube down their throat three times a day and gave them food. Same food, just different amounts. We wanted to make some fatter than they'd be, that's the overfed. We wanted to make some thinner than they'd be, and we wanted to have some that were sort of in the middle of controls. After 135 days, that's a long time for a rat. We uh, stopped overfeeding them, just let them eat. And what do you think happens? The animals that were overweight ate less food, their weight came down. The animals that were underweight ate more food, their weight went up, and at the end, there's no difference among any of those groups. That looked like pretty good regulation to me. I mean, you know, we displaced them for a long period of time. Soon as we stop, bang. Just like people on a diet, they lose weight, have good enthusiasm, the enthusiasm goes away, their weight comes back. Very uh, similar in, in some ways. This is a slide I borrow from my colleague Randy Seeley to see how accurate humans are with this regulation. And if we take a, uh, an average 70 kilogram uh, person, I was gonna say Gary, but he's much lighter than that, I suspect. But uh, imagine that he's uh, 70 kilograms. In a year, such a person eats around a million calories. That's what they take in. If Gary were to gain one pound over that year, that only takes around 4,000 calories, different uh, from baseline. And it turns out that would be a tiny error, right? 11 calories a day to gain a pound or lose a pound. It's the equivalent of about one potato chip. This is a tiny error. Let me point out that the obesity epidemic, so-called, is less than a pound a year. And so 
the point from this is that we actually regulate mighty well. Uh, you know, a tiny little error in the system. Now, all of these things, studies like this, conspire compellingly to tell us that we have some kind of a homeostatic regulation for body fat. I mean, you know, whatever you do, that's the way it looks. So we have two points of view. Population studies tell us that can't be true because we're getting fatter. These physiological studies in animals and people and so on suggest we should be regulating. So, so what's wrong? Where where the system go bad? And again, there's a tension, I think, between the misconception that homeostasis is something unique and that there's other things, and, and, and I'm going to talk about that now for a couple of minutes. What determines when we eat? Do we eat because our blood sugar is too low and our brain's getting a message or our stomach is growling and telling us we got to eat? I don't think so. I think, in fact, I know we don't. We eat because of habit. We eat because somebody prepared a meal for us. We eat because we got a break in our schedule and we can grab a bite before we run to the next meeting. You know, social reasons. These are the reasons we initiate meals. It has, I think, very little to do, if anything, with, with the biology of the energy in our body. And so, if there's going to be regulation, it must occur on how much we eat once we start eating. And, and I've spent most of my life studying what determines how much we eat once we pick up our fork and start eating. And, and, and here's the, the first big point. The things that determine when you eat are quite different than the factors that determine how much you eat. As I said, we eat because of, of non-homeostatic reasons, convenience, so on and so forth. But there's compelling evidence, I believe, that one of the factors that contributes to how much we eat are signals generated while we're eating from the gastrointestinal tract. <clears throat> so what do we know about these things? As I said, years ago, people thought that blood glucose, stomach contractions, these were the key. We know that that isn't the case. I mean, the studies have ruled it out. 1973, Jim Gibbs and Jerry Smith at Cornell did a landmark study. It was done in rats. They took the hormone that comes from your intestine when you eat, cholecystokine, and then injected it into rats. Here's a uh, model of that experiment. And here's a control day. The rat ate that amount of food shown in the bar. On another day, they gave it CCK, and it ate less food. CCK was called a satiation factor uh, based upon that. And this mushroomed into a huge revolution, if you will, uh, if you will in terms of what people think about uh, eating. Uh, it, it, it influenced me, it influenced uh, my uh, research, or maybe diverted my research for uh, 25 years or so. It's a simple model that came out of it. Negative feedback. We eat, the food gets into our gut, up in the upper left. I guess I don't have a pointer. Oh, it's just a pointer, but look at that. Who would have guessed? Food gets into the gut, has some metabolic effects, whatever they are. These are detected and it turns off the meal. It's a simple negative feedback system. And the idea was that some of the the signals that come from the gut as we're eating are what makes this work. And again, Gibbs and Smith uh, said that CCK, this CCK was the first, it's the poster child for uh, satiation factors. And uh, uh, it's a very compelling theory. Uh, negative feedback, you get enough calories in, it's detected, and you turn off the meal. There's a few features of this. Uh, the more CCK you give, the greater the, the suppression of food intake. That makes perfect sense. There's another important point about this slide. It doesn't matter how much CCK you give, you cannot keep the meal from beginning. All it can do is get you to eat less once you start. Again, it has nothing to do with when you eat. It has to do with how much you eat. Over the years, 
lots and lots of uh, gut factors have been put forward to be satiation factors. All of these are secreted in relation to meals, CCK at the top, and while I'm talking about it, you're gonna see asterisks appear by some of these. The asterisks relate to molecules that are being or are in clinical trials to be used in humans to influence food intake. Right? And, and there are a lot of them. Some of them, analogs of amylin and of GLP-1 and so on, are actually out there now and people lose a little weight. There's no evidence in humans that I've seen that they lose weight because they're eating less, by the way. There's other metabolic effects of these compounds. I have ghrelin down there at the bottom. Ghrelin acts the opposite. If you inject ghrelin into a rat or a person, they'll eat a bigger meal. In other words, it seems to be the opposite. Ghrelin comes from the stomach. And I'll talk about ghrelin at the end. So there's a lot of these things. This is a, a, a short list. The actual list today with compounds most of us have never heard of is three times this long. So what do we know about these signals? They're secreted during meals. In humans, they create a sensation of fullness. People, when they're given these things, and humans have gotten virtually all of these things, they say, I feel full. They don't say they're sick. They simply eat less food uh, when it's given to them. They work in humans. I mean, this is obviously important. This is a, a very old slide. I could have lots of slides. These were the first studies in which CCK was given to humans. It works in men, it works in women, it works in lean people, it works in fat people. It reduces how much they eat. This was an important finding. You can take an antagonist of CCK and inject it into rats, into humans, and they eat a bigger meal. That's important because it suggests that their own CCK is contributing to meal size. And it was one of the first studies. Again, a control day here and the number of calories day when they were given a CCK uh, antagonist. And it suggests that our own CCK every time we eat is somehow contributing to how much we eat. Why aren't we uh, taking CCK every day before every meal if we want to lose weight, right? Well, uh, we asked that question a long time ago. We set up a automatic cages with rats. Every time the rat would start eating, a computer gave it automatically an injection of CCK. And over the course of a week, Here's a control week on the left, that sort of funny looking color bar, and the red bar is when they got CCK. Every meal was reduced by 50%. I mean, wow, these should be really skinny rats. The problem, of course, was that on the control week, they ate 11 meals a day, and on this CCK week, they ate 22 meals a day. I know, I know the food industry people can figure this out, but the NIH people may not. But, if you cut every meal in half and double the number, guess what happens to how much you eat? Well, the rats really uh, stayed the same. They kept up with us. They have no problem changing their meal schedule to keep up with uh, what you're doing. So this was a model that, uh, that we published several years ago. We call it the peptide signal model of food intake. It's, it's a, uh, uh, a homeostatic-based model. And what I've been talking about is the satiation system, which is down in the lower right. And this is when you're eating, signals coming from the gut, the stomach, maybe the liver and so on, they travel up nerves, maybe the vagus nerve to the hindbrain. They, uh, some of them circulate directly there. And this is the pathway by which these satiation signals are thought to work and influence the brain. And there's another part of this. It's called the adiposity system, and that's up here sort of in the middle on the left. And there are hormones that all of us secrete in proportion to how fat we are. Leptin and insulin have gotten the most PR, and uh, they're shown here. The fatter you are, the more leptin and insulin you secrete. The thinner you are, the less insulin and leptin you secrete. And rather than traveling via nerves, these go directly into the hypothalamus and other brain areas. And so your, your, your hypothalamus 
if it has receptors for insulin and leptin, knows how fat you are. It simply has to read off the level of insulin or leptin. It's a nice, uh, uh, simple kind of system. And again, if we believe in homeostatic regulation of body fat, which I did for much of my life, there's a model something like this. I'm using insulin and leptin as the examples because they're the best known and the ones I've studied much of my life. So the amount of stored calories, you can read that as the amount of fat you've got in your body, secrete insulin and leptin in direct proportion. These hormones get into the brain and if you've gained weight, your brain knows it and it causes you to eat less and bring your weight down and vice versa. It's a nice negative feedback regulation of body fat. And, uh, and you can put insulin or leptin in the brain. Animals and, uh, well, it's been done with insulin in, in humans. They, they act as if they think they're too fat. They eat less food and lose weight. Seems very nice. So, how do the satiation factors and these adiposity factors work together? And so, here's the two kinds of signals, adiposity signals mainly in the hypothalamus, satiation signals coming into the back of the brain. And here, lots and lots of studies have, have found that this is the way they work. Adiposity signals work by simply changing the sensitivity of the brain to compounds like CCK or GLP-1 or all of the others that have been studied. And it looks something like this. Normal food intake, control intake, is up here at this dotted line. If you give animals or people CCK, they eat less food. If you take the same animal on a different day and put a tiny amount of insulin or leptin into the brain, an amount so little that it does nothing to the animal by itself, CCK is much more potent, maybe twice as potent. Likewise, if you take away the insulin or leptin signal, they eat more food. And so how fat you are enters into the calculus by simply changing your sensitivity to CCK and other satiation signals. So this is the homeostatic model of food intake. I've hung my hat on it for years, even though I don't believe it anymore. And it, it makes eating and body weight regulation seem very mechanical, like we're robots going around, around slaves to uh, the, our insulin and leptin and CCK and so on. And it ignores everything we know about meals and food intake. It just simply doesn't take them into account. These are non-homeostatic influences, and the question is, how does it all get put together? Well, let me first say that the, the non-homeostatic signals that we're aware of that have been studied do exactly the same as homeostatic signals. They cause you to eat smaller meals. They feed into the same system. Marcy looks like she doesn't believe it, but that's okay. I got the data <laughs> and the podiums. <laughs> And, of course, adiposity signals, in turn, completely influence the non-homeostatic system. I mean, calling them homeostatic and non-homeostatic really makes no sense to me anymore, but, but whatever. So, we doing all right on time? Okay, good. I, I have this uh, strange uh, drawing of a uh, person here to make a couple of important points. One is, there are a lot of meal-related signals that exist that we could be uh, talking about. The sight and smell of food, the taste, I put all those in for Gary's, uh, I, sh I should, well, that's sort of the same nose. Stomach signals, intestinal signals, upper intestinal, lower intestinal, signals from the pancreas, adiposity-related signals. All of these are feeding in all of the time. Some, some integrated calculus determines in principle uh, what we're doing. Well, I want to give two examples um, that 
have made me really question whether there's homeostasis of fat or not homeostasis of fat. And let me, uh, let me begin with ghrelin. This hormone I mentioned a while ago, it comes mainly from the stomach, but as you see by this black dot up here, it's also made in the brain, okay? Ghrelin is the compound that if you inject it into a human, they'll start eating. And if you inject more ghrelin, they'll eat more. Okay, it's an it's a, uh, interesting uh, compound. It's the only major compound that circulates in your blood that has this, uh, this action. When you're starved, your ghrelin goes up. That makes perfect sense because you'd want it to go up to get you to eat more so you'd get your weight back up, right? It's been touted all of its life. All of its life means about 20 years. I mean, you know, it's been around a long time, but that's, that's the scientific life of it. It's been touted as, as a major homeostatic uh, hormone. Well, let's see some of the things it does. As I just said, its levels go up when you're fasted or if you've lost weight. But through the CNS, the brain, it actually turns on much of the gastrointestinal tract. And that makes sense in a homeostatic way. It gets the system ready for the meal that's coming in. But it actually increases your sense of smell so that you can enhance it, so that uh, you're maybe better able to detect food. Um, it makes good food taste better. Several papers have shown this. It enhances the reward value of food. And of course, it stimulates eating. Now, you know, ghrelin is working at lots of points in here. Lots of points, many of them we would consider homeostatic, many of them we would consider non-homeostatic. What is ghrelin? Is it a homeostatic hormone? Ah, I don't have any idea. Let me talk about a, a uh, the new kid on the block. Um, assume that you're eating a highly palatable food. Any of what you, you guys company puts out, really good tasting, you know, whatever. Taste feeds into the brain back at the, the brain stem, the hind brain, right? Now, through a series of relays, it of course uh, feeds up into the uh, so-called non-homeostatic system, gets dopamine turned on, that's what a good taste does, right? And at the same time, the message gets to the lateral hypothalamus, this other area where uh, uh, orexin is made, and Secondarily, signals come from the, the dopamine stimulating part also. And so the lateral hypothalamus is getting a lot of information about this good tasting food. Well, one of the many pathways from the lateral hypothalamus goes to the arcuate nucleus, another part of the hypothalamus right here. And this pathway, as I, as I said earlier, is what contains orexin. It also secretes glutamate, both of those things. Well, the arcuate nucleus is interesting because that's where insulin and leptin are sensed, and that's the, the, the poster child for homeostatic regulation of body fat. Everything comes from the arcuate. So what I'm going to do now is show you a kind of a mock blow up of this area right here so I can explain a study that's just been done. Um, so here's the lateral hypothalamus and here's this good tasting input feeding into it. And as I just said, we also have the reward system feeding into it also. Right? Now, separate from this, we have the arcuate nucleus over here and one group of nerve cells in the arcuate nucleus makes a compound called neuropeptide Y, NPY. Neuropeptide Y is the most potent known factor in the brain to stimulate food intake. 
it really powerfully, if you, if you put it into a rat's brain, it, the rat starts eating in seconds. I mean, it's a very powerful transmitter. And again, in recent years, it's been discovered that from the lateral hypothalamus to the arcuate, these nerves contain the transmitters orexin and glutamate. Fine, that's easy. Now I'm gonna show you the results of a study that's in press from Mike Schwartz's lab in Seattle. Mike Schwartz was able to isolate the orexin neurons in the lateral hypothalamus and simultaneously to record the, the changes of glutamate, which are in these neurons he's controlling here uh, in the arcuate. Now, this is a kind of a strange slide. What's on the uh, vertical axis here is the amount of glutamate showing up in the arcuate nucleus. He has a way of doing this online in awake behaving animals. And remember, he's, he knows that he's playing directly with that one subset of orex and glutamate neurons from the lateral hypothalamus. So if you look at these little squares along here, that's what happens when the rat is drinking water. The, the NPY glutamate, or the arcuate glutamate, isn't changing at all. You can see that. That's these squares. When the rat's given its bland rat chow, believe me, it's bland. I've, I've eaten it over the years. Not because <laughs> I had, my, my mentor said, you don't give anything to a rat, you don't try yourself. That was a, the rule of thumb. It, it brought back memories of going to the county fair. When I, <laughs> well, you know, if you've got a good imagination, you can see that the, the, the arcuate is uh, getting a little excited from, uh, from these neurons, right? So now, he gives high fat diet. And I'm gonna show you what happens here. here. Here's the effect, it's the same rat, it's the same amount going in on the tongue. What's important is, that the first time point he can get, this is in seconds. Within two seconds of getting that on the tongue, this pathway is turned on, suggesting that NPY is turned on and getting you to eat more. Two seconds, right? The animal had never had that palatable food before. I mean, this is a very powerful uh, demonstration of, of a non-homeostatic influence, um, uh, influence, influencing a so-called uh, homeostatic influence. And so again, within two seconds, it probably, almost, probably within a second, but that's the first reading he could get uh, in these animals. Uh, it's, it, it was mind-boggling to me. It happens so fast that it's, you know, a very uh, powerful phenomenon. He had nice controls, bland food and water that, uh, that didn't do it. So, what are the takeaway points that I want you to have from what I've uh, told you today? Huh, what, uh, I'm gonna get done early, but that's because there'll be so many questions. <laughs> well, either that or I'll stand here and philosophize for you. The, the takeaway point that isn't on here, but the one to which I've been alluding, is I think it's time we got rid of terms like homeostatic and non-homeostatic. It, it, it's like it sets a, a, a series of stimuli apart from others when there is no separation of these things in the brain. The, the data on on humans and animals that there's good regulation comes from, in animals, we, we take a rat or a mouse and we put it in a small cage and it's like living in, the, in a closet with a refrigerator in there, it can eat whenever it wants, there's no social interaction, there's no stress, there's none of the things that influence your life and mine, and yeah, you get good evidence of regulation. If you look at the studies, the really good studies that demonstrate regulation in people, 
The first uh, was by Ethan Allen Sims at the University of Vermont, uh, where he overfed humans, had them overfeed, and at a, after a period of time, he let them stop, and lo and behold, their weight came right back to where it had been. Those humans were prisoners in the, universe, in the state of Vermont prison system. They were living in a uh, cell just like our rats. I mean, there was no other influence on them. And to get the data that more recent people, Rudy LaBelle, Eric Ravison, and so on, they also have very strict uh, environmental controls, and they're just not realistic. Um, I think that what's realistic is that our environment has changed, our weight's going up, we're eating more, and, and I, I don't know what that means for the concept of homeostasis. If you have a, a real life situation, it goes up. If, if I were to uh, live in the, above a French restaurant, my weight would go up, take my word for it. And if I were to have to live with my mother and her cooking, it would go down. <laughs> So that editorial aside, if there is a separate system for homeostasis, it's certainly not fixed. It's very plastic. It's very malleable by everything else that's going on in the body and in your life. Non-homeostatic, again, I would just, today just say others, and especially reward circuits, can overwhelm the system very easily. And they do. They're all interconnected. And uh, I don't even know if I'd use the term rigorous. I guess they are rigorous when there's no other variable. But so would stress be, or so would anything else be. If you didn't let the extraneous systems come in, they'd look rigorous. Finally, of course, and, and this is what many of the other speakers who have been cringing throughout my talk and wondering how they're going to recoup anything that they've said in front of NIH people. The uh, drugs of abuse can co-opt um, these systems, uh, take over, and, uh, uh, and at least make food look like an addiction. Uh, depending on your definition of an addiction, but fortunately we have a lot of experts here other than myself to deal with that. So I'm going to end there. Thank you. <laughs>